Before we introduce our next speaker, I want to bring to your attention that back in January 2021, earlier this year, PPI published an article as part of the PPI thinking on how to accelerate the deployment of COVID-19 vaccines, an operation science perspective. And the article proposed a variety of actions for those in the government, for those involved in, you know, COVID-19 vaccines. And the reason why we bring this up is because our next speaker is going to touch on this and he has actually been able to implement some of the recommendations that this article published by PPI proposed. That being said, I would like to welcome Randy Kelly. So Randy, if you can please share your video and I wanna make sure that we can hear you as well. Can you hear me, Randy? Yes, I can hear you fine. How about me? Okay. So can you hear me now? Yes. Great. So we are going to, uh, Randy, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the symposium and really look forward to hear your story. And it's going to be about an estate level COVID vaccination program. And so, but please allow me to introduce you, Randy, formally and say more about you. Randy has recently led operations at multiple mass vaccination sites throughout North Carolina. The lack of fundamental operations knowledge in government and private sectors healthcare provided Randy the chance to implement operation science to that process. With a speedy adoption of these principles, the resultant turnaround had profound results in customer served, increased throughput and much higher revenues for those involved. Prior to that, Randy worked on the largest construction project in the world, providing technical support based on operations and supply chain, uh, supply chain science to several project teams. Randy has spent 11 years as a U.S. Navy SEAL sniper with combat tours in Iraq and other hotspots. In 2005, he had founded Red Tail Corporation, a specialized defense company, provided training and surveillance uh, equipment to U.S. and international special operations units. As CEO, he built the company to over 6 million in revenue by 2010, and then it started seven other companies, which he then uh, proceeded to sell uh, or move into other ventures. Randy has an MBA in global management from Thunderbird School of Global Management. Randy, once again, thanks for being with us. And let me stop sharing my screen. So it will be over to you. Everything okay? Uh, no, you're still, I think you still have control over the screen. Okay, let me, let me see if I can solve that problem here, excuse me. Okay, please there go we, ahead. There we go. Yeah. Thank you, Randy. Right. No worries. All right. Okay, so you just see the, the regular view, right? Okay. Thank you very much, Roberto, for the introduction. Uh, thank you all very much for the, for the chance to, to speak with this symposium. It's good to see you all again. And I'm pretty excited to share this, this case study that I actually worked on. You'll see almost all these pictures I, I took while I was on site. So I just let a lot of the pictures do the talking and I'll just fill in some of the details. So uh, let's start with this. I'm currently, uh, currently working on a special project for the US Navy, but earlier this year, I had the chance to, uh, I had a chance to uh, provide operations consulting to companies providing COVID-19 va uh, vaccines throughout the state of North Carolina. I'd like to share how the principles of operation science worked in that 
and that turnaround. So first of all, I went to North Carolina in April this year, and this was just before President Biden opened up all the COVIDs to those over age 16. That was, uh, before then, it was only for high-risk person people, but we're about to open up, open this up for all U.S. citizens throughout the, for, throughout the country. And for North Carolina, that meant a population of about 8 million adults. To meet this demand, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson Johnson all shipped their vaccines directly to the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Those two facilities were in Charlotte, Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, and they were stored in these ultra-cold freezers that, uh, that you see here it brings the temperature way down. So as full vaccination approval spread across the country, mass vaccination sites quickly opened up in Charlotte and Raleigh, right next to those freezers. They were also the two most populous cities in North Carolina. You see Charlotte and Raleigh right here. Demand was so great, however, that we saw major traffic jams at these two sites for days on end. This frustrated healthcare workers and those wanting the shots. These pictures are of uh, Bojangles Coliseum there in Charlotte. Uh, many of these people were turned away. Vaccines were uh, not available based on, on, on the supply chain and uh, management here. So the first thing we did, the first operations principle I was able to institute was, hey, let's redistribute these mass vaccination super sites into more geographically dispersed areas. We, and we set those up for in-car or mobile vaccinations. You see here, we went from two cities to well over 15, uh, possibly 20 cities throughout the state. You can see what one of these uh, sites look like in this, this picture right here. This is Randolph County, North Carolina. These now dispersed sites greatly relieved traffic congestion and gave more customers access to these vaccination clinics. The results were rapid and total throughput throughput shot through the roof for, for, for the whole state. Once that was taken care of, we uh, turned our attention basically to standardizing the process at these mobile and walk-in clinics. You'll see a walk-in clinic right here, I think in States, Statesville, North Carolina. We weren't able to affect some changes on such short notice. For example, they uh, we had double, double data entry for these, for these customers and they had to fill out an online form before they ever showed up. And when they did show up, they actually filled out a very similar paper form. However, uh, we were able to specifically identify where we wanted to control this, this bottleneck. So let's take a quick look at that bottleneck. When the vaccine is defrosted from a cold storage, it's drawn up on site and has to be used that day or be discarded at the end of the day. Uh, most of these sites were batching do doses early in the morning and then discarding thousands of dollars of vaccines at the end of the day. Or more often, they were running short and turning away patients. Through online scheduling, we went from individual scheduling to a basically batch scheduling, meaning for example, 50 people could come during this 15-minute this section. We were able to forecast, forecast daily demand, and, and I added a variability buffer of that of 8% based on empirical data over the pre preceding few weeks. We would then not draw the dose until a patient signed in, and that, that dropped the vaccine waste to almost zero. You can see here the flow diagram of what it looks like and the vaccine draw was triggered by the patient signing. When we folk that, that was able to, to, to make, the, uh, the, make the process much, much more efficient without wasting vaccines. We then focused on cross-training all these personnel in, in order to provide site-wide and then eventually statewide capacity increases because we were in the midst of a severe work, healthcare worker shortage. If you remember, many of these nurses were, were just, there was not enough of, of them to give these vaccines. 
So with a relatively smooth process going on at vaccination sites, one of the CEOs came of the companies came to me and asked if I would look at his back office. And man, uh, was I in for the shock. The first thing I saw was a room full of registration forms awaiting entry into the statewide system of accounting. Obviously, in operation science, science uh, speak, we call this visible work in progress or WIP. In this picture, you'll see about uh, 130,000 registration forms, and each of them represented about $144 each in invoice. That total is $18.7 million in revenue just waiting for, for entry. And this was just one month of vaccine forms. So my first comment was something about the time value of money to which the CEO, a fine doctor, by the way, gave me a blank look. He admitted that uh, with the man of vaccine so high, he was putting all his efforts into administering the shots throughout the state, ignoring the quickly growing piles of forms need need needing data entry. At this point in time, he was sitting on over eight, eight, 18 million in revenue and in invoices while shelling out millions of operational expenses weekly. So we immediately mapped out a process and we moved 20 employees into the back office to run a Kanban uh, line and, and round the clock shifts. We were able to move from a medical billing of once a month to twice weekly schedule, getting a much needed flow of cash throughout the company. Additionally, data entries had about a 30% error rate. Yeah, 30%. We knew that because patients would call and complain. So we instituted a quality control check while the, while the data worker had both online documents open and the paper document at once. Error rates were now calculated daily and dropped significantly. Over the next few weeks, we continued improving all the existing processes while, while initial demand for the vaccines eventually began to dwindle. With the dropping demand for the vaccines, the recommended technology improvements were sidelined, but the key operational improvements continued to pay off. So in, in conclusion, the experience was not unlike the deployment of operation science to construction projects for many of the companies represented here. And just like many of those projects, these the concepts may be introduced mid-project just before things really start to break down. This breaks, This obviously creates tension within the project. project. And like uh, Dave McKay said earlier, hey, if we start implementing operation science early, but even if not mid-project, just do it. Once adopted, however, the principles do amazing, amazing things for project completion. In this case, the extreme lack of operations knowledge with, with these healthcare professionals coupled with some key wins gave these managers some very strong desires to learn and implement these principles. So they're hungry for this knowledge. I really did enjoy working on this project, especially when I could see immediate results, which is not always the case, especially in these in oil and gas and in construction. But it, it did, it obviously worked and you can see it real time. I hope you enjoyed hearing a little something different from what you're, what you may be used to, but still relevant to the, to the greater pro project production management movement. And at this time, I'd love to hear your comment and questions. Thank you, Randy, so much. And this is actually quite a, quite impressive what you have done on the vaccination program and, and the ability of putting in practice some of the Operation, uh, operation science principles, right? And this is something that Todd mentioned in the, in the session earlier about modern construction is like, you know, if you're looking to modernize construction or any sort of production system, really focus on understanding operation science. I think your story, it's a validation of that statement. And there's actually some observations and as, as we get some questions for, from the audience, I will be passing them to you, okay? but. There's something that really took my attention and, and you were saying that you move from one of the strategies you put in place is to trying to schedule the appointments, right? Yes. On a precise time and moving for a larger chunk of time where there's more flexibility, right? For people to come in and, and get vaccinated, right? 
Did we did we get that correctly? That is correct. Yes. Right. So you basically, for a specific chunk of time, you eliminated the scheduling, right, yeah. as the way forward or the way to do it. The reason why it, this is a very important highlight is because we see we see that a lot in projects, right? You also have experience in projects uh, working in, in oil and gas to to some extent, and 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 you have seen how teams are really driving for scheduling, right? Yes. Versus actually allowing the production system to be the one that is more flexible and more allows to increase the throughput. So the question for you is, can you, can you say more about that? I mean, what, tell us more about that change from scheduling for a specific time to sort of a, a more flexible perspective, no scheduling to some extent. Absolutely. And this was a hard one for many of these uh, CEOs, as well as the administrators throughout the state to actually understand that it was, uh, that it was more advantageous to do something like this. They, they, they wanted to, in medical organizations, you know, if you're John Brown, you show up at, John, at this time and so they're, they were so used to that, that when you're dealing with thousands and thousands of people on a daily basis, and it really wasn't relevant to the throughput of the, of the, of the entire process. So I was able to uh, argue the, and they took it on board and it took a few, even before this, there were some customer complaints saying, you know, I, I, I had a 10 o'clock appointment and I had to wait for an hour before I could actually be seen. So, uh, so, it, and it was it was easier on the entire system for for these these chunks of people in these chunks of time, with the capacity variability at the site to be able to handle those. And once we controlled the bottleneck, which was the the one we wanted to, which was the actual vaccine draw everything else was able to just to flow from that. Excellent. So I do have a comment for you that uh, one of a member in our audience is wants to pass to you is a great insights, different industry, but similar experiences and results, right? And it's probably worth uh, talking a bit about what he's saying, because, you know, what you did is look at the vaccination production system, right? Yes. And what the vaccination production system produces is a person vaccinated, right? You, me, anybody, right? The question is, what happens in that production system to get a person vaccinated? You highlighted working process and the picture of all the paperwork is, is quite a uh, speak by itself. Um, there's another question for you here. So we have someone saying, amazing, how widely are these principles being applied now based on what you know in this sort of approach? So uh, here was my observation. The companies, for example, Pfizer and Moderna, have their operations science principles working because they're used to this type of uh, ramp up. Operation warp speed was, was just a typical um, production line that they are used to doing. Once these vaccines came out outside of the, of the company into the hands of health departments and then, and then subcontracted companies to actually put that out, the knowledge of operation science was, it was nowhere to be found. Nobody knew what to do with this and how to, how to work this. So, my experience, I only saw a few other states. I went to Puerto Rico, I looked at their system also, but and none of them understood the operation science principles. Once I introduced this in North Carolina, they understood it, that it worked. They didn't really understand uh, exa exactly why it was short term. We were right in the middle of some major demand and in, 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 in working those issues. But my experience with government officials is they're, they're hungry for this, but they may not be incentivized to make it all work quickly as, as for example, some of the companies uh, who had revenue sitting around. Um, right, right. So, okay. 
Thank you, Randy, so much. And, and, you know, a lot of similarities from previous stories we have seen, right? The use of operational science, you know, that drives the behavior of the production system to looking at what you're doing, what the teams are doing as a production system, right? There's a throughput that you want to get target. The implications of having a necessary working process uh, in the system, right? Not getting enough throughput out of it and in a completely different I will say within this context on what we're, what we're doing. So a lot of similarities as well with the article that the PPI published earlier this year. So thank you, Randy, on behalf of PPI for your participation and, and bringing us your story. Very powerful, very, very good, amazing. Yeah, definitely my pleasure. And the funny thing is I actually didn't have the chance to read this article before I did this. So the, so the operation science I've learned doing construction just naturally applied to this very quickly. Excellent. That's, that's good to hear. Thank you so much. Appreciate right, my it. pleasure. Thank you.